what is stunning here is the success that Israel had, and I was trying to get a sense, what is the secret of the success? Uh, but that's a topic for a different conversation, maybe in a question and answer. Let me uh, try to describe a bit uh, what is chronic capitalism. Uh, this is a term that uh, was uh, basically unknown until 20 years ago, and now is becoming more and more important. So I, I thought that I want to start uh, basic, uh, starting from the basics. And uh, because most of you uh, are born probably after uh, 1989, I want to start uh, describe the world uh, before 1989, a world that uh, unfortunately I remember well, and uh, it's a world where there was a juxtaposition between two uh, forms of uh, running the economy. There was capitalism and there was communism, and of course uh, many countries were in between, and uh, of course Israel at the beginning was in this spectrum, maybe closer to the right than to the left, uh, but uh, if you want to classify what are the characteristics of these two systems, uh, in a capitalist system, first of all, your private property of means of production. In, in Soviet Union, uh, you could own a house, but you could not own a factory or a shop. Um, you have that most resources were allocated through voluntary exchange. Um, and of course, there are exceptions. So for example, uh, even in the United States, you cannot uh, trade a kidney. Uh, while uh, I just learned that in the uh, Islamic Republic of Iran, you can trade kidneys. So um, that's a, a remarkable feature. Um, you have freedom of contract, so you can write, uh, accept uh, uh, um, selling yourself as slave or selling a part of your body, like a kidney. Uh, you can write any contract you want. Um, and uh, one aspect is often forgotten, you have freedom of entry. So you can start a new business without necessarily having a license or without the permission of anybody except uh, your own uh, decision. And communism was uh, on the other side of the spectrum. The mineral production were controlled basically entirely by the state. The resources were allocated by fiat, not by prices, but voluntary exchange, but by uh, the power of the government. Uh, there were plenty of restriction of contracts and there were restriction of entry. And while today, to your generation, uh, the right column seems to be kind of uh, absurd, it was extremely popular. Uh, not only, of course, in the Soviet bloc, uh, but also in the Western world that was looking up to uh, the Soviet bloc in many dimensions, particularly the intellectual class. Look at it in a major way. And then, of course, uh, uh, 1989 came about. And with the fall of the Berlin Wall, um, uh, Fukuyama, a political scientist, famously said, this is the end of history. And of course, it was a bit overstated, uh, and, uh, but you have to understand the context in which you said the end of history. The end of history in the Hegelian sense of uh, just exposition between a thesis and an antithesis because uh, the antithesis has collapsed. What uh, used to be believable as an alternative uh, became unbelievable. And almost overnight, uh, in Italy, at the time, there was a fairly uh, large communist party. Okay, it changed his name. Uh, of course, the people in power remain the same, but it changed his name because it was inconceivable to run a platform with a name communist on it. Okay, in that sense, was a dramatic change in uh, the cultural debate, at least in the Western world. And my claim is after that, the world after 1989, uh, the real debate, the real tension, the tension that is to this day, is not between uh, uh, capitalism and communism or socialism, but it is between two forms of capitalism, what I consider competitive capitalism and what I like to call chronic capitalism. So in what way they differ? Okay, first of all, in a competitive system, you have to have an impartial enforcement of the law. And uh, now you say in every civilized country, you have impartial enforcement of the law, actually, the more you look into that carefully, the more that's not true. And uh, the impartial enforcement law is a crucial element for the system to work well. The second is that uh, everybody's treated the same, a, a relatively uh, level playing field. And uh, some form of antitrust enforcement to maintain competition. Uh, and some form of uh, more equal opportunity. Now, Having perfectly equal opportunity is impossible, but at least an attempt to 
equalize the starting points. So think about uh, a competitive catalyst as the game of golf, in which you can have some handicap at the beginning to equalize the starting point, but then everybody plays on an equal playing field or the, in the uh, golf field, and uh, in the same way. Uh, the difference with crony uh, catalyst is uh, favorite is in enforcement, so the law is applied differently depending on who you know and who you are. Um, there is uh, even the regulation and uh, uh, the advantages or disadvantages can be applied separately to politically connected firms and non-politically connected firms. There is no very lax antitrust enforcement, and this is one of the characteristics, unlike uh, the equal opportunity world, you have both economic and political dynasties. When uh, uh, there was the, the, the risk of having a competition between a Bush and a Clinton, I said uh, uh, the United States is tantamount to Argentina. Uh, in, in Argentina, you transmit by husband and wife and children uh, your position and uh, from the Perón to the Kirchner and so on and so forth. So uh, that's, that's a terrible sign uh, of a degeneration. Now, why do I think that today this distinction is very important? Is because I want to state a number of uh, uh, statements that uh, most of them I think are controversial. The central one you might disagree, but uh, I think is pretty well uh, based. So the first one is, and I think this is uncontroversial, that capitalists to work needs to produce some inequality. We might like it or not, but it does produce some inequality. And the question is, how do you deal or cope with inequality in a democratic society? Uh, if you have the tanks protecting the rich, then maybe you can afford to have inequality uh, at, at any possible level. But in a, in a democracy, uh, I think uh, my, and this is where is my inference of political science, and, and maybe I'm, I'm sort of uh, overstating my boundaries, but I think I'm pretty right in saying that in a democracy, inequality is tolerated under three conditions. Number one, that people consider it fair, uh, so people do not resent that Steve Jobs is so rich or was so rich, because they can see why he got so rich. People don't resent generally that Messi or whoever player you like is so rich because they can see the quality uh, of this. They resent when uh, the wealth is accumulated in different ways. Second, that this level of uh, richness or wealth makes somewhat everybody better off. So let me make a, a very important comparison. Uh, in China, inequality went up in the last 20 years basically as much as in the United States. However, China is not a democracy, but there's not so much protest. Why? Because when you grow 7% a year, um, everybody benefits. And uh, so even uh, the median Chinese is so much better off than his father or his mother, that is not even funny. The problem that we have today in the United States is that the median worker, has not seen an increase in its real salary in 40 years. So it means that the majority of Americans did not see any improvement in the last 40 years. So it's very hard to support a system, let alone a system that generates inequality, but support a system if you don't see the system benefited you, benefiting you in any possible form or shape. And the third one is the idea, and this is very much an American idea, uh, that is embedded in the ethos of uh, the American society, is everybody has a chance. Uh, the idea is everybody has a chance to become president. Uh, everybody has a chance to become CEO of a large corporation. Everybody has a chance of the so-called American dream. When you have these elements, uh, then I think that you can uh, withstand some inequality. But when these elements are not present, uh, then this is a problem. And the chronic capitalist, the way I defined it just before, undermines all three of these characteristics. So it really undermines the support for a, a capitalist system in democracy. So 
capitalist is either the one on the left hand side, the competitive capitalist, or is not in a democracy, or is not democratic. Uh, so I think that there is no ability to support that. And to give you a little bit of evidence, let me show you this picture that I took from somebody else's work, but I found it fascinating. Let me explain what it is first. On the x-axis, you have um, the, a measure of concentration uh, of income, so a measure of inequality, it's called so-called Gini coefficient, but basically the only thing you need to know is that the more to the right, the more uh, in unequal the society is. And on the y-axis, you have a thing that is called the intergenerational elasticity of income, which means, say, if I tell you um, how much, uh, you are, if I know how much my parents were making, uh, what, uh, what is the likelihood that, um, what is uh, the predictive power on my income? And of course, the larger that number is, the more, the, the, the less there is social mobility, the more stable society is. So if the coefficient is 0.8, it means that uh, uh, a uh, richer parent will have 80% uh, chances, let's put this simply, of having a very rich uh, child as well. And now, Look at this picture because you see that uh, to the extreme right, so clearly the more uh, to the right and to the up, the more you have an unequal and immobile society. So in a society that violates all the rules that I wrote down uh, in the previous slide. And what you see is that um, the first bunch of countries are Latin American countries that are not known for the quality of their institutions and democracy. Uh, some of them have gone in and out of dictatorship, uh, not very stable overall. Then you get China, not a democracy. Then you get Singapore, not a democracy. Then you have the United States, just elected a populist president. <laughs> then you have Italy, just elected a populist government. And then you have the United Kingdom, that they don't have a populist government, but they got out of, uh, they voted in favor of Brexit for a similar reason. So, and on the other hand, if you look at the most stable democracy, like De Denmark, Norway, Finland, uh, Sweden, uh, even Germany are completely on the other end of the spectrum. So, um, of course, correlation is not causation, uh, and so I should be very careful in, in making very strong causal statement. However, I think it's pretty suggestive that there is something going on here. It's very difficult to maintain a capitalist system in a world where there is a lot of uh, inequality and this inequality is not uh, providing benefits to everybody, is not uh, justified based on uh, quality and talent, and where people don't have well, so a fair chance. And uh, one of my fears these days, I did not believe until a few years ago that I will say that, but one of the uh, big fears these days is that um, what, one risk is that you go into a completely uh, sort of populist uh, uh, system a la uh, Peron. Uh, the other system, the other risk is that we drift into a less and less democratic society. Uh, I was listening the other day a panel at the Brookings Institute, not exactly a right-wing institution, and uh, in the panel there was a former member of the Clinton administration, of Bill Clinton administration, and uh, this guy said institutions are meant to deliver good outcomes, and if in order to improve the outcome I have to give up democracy or some democracy, I'm all for it. If I want to be, in order to get better outcome, I'm prepared to give up some democracy, I'm all for it. This said by a guy who belongs to a party called Democratic Party. Okay, so I think that that's a sign, and, and this sign is, is very widespread. In Europe, uh, they basically came out from the Brexit referendum say, you shouldn't let people vote, it's dangerous. Uh, let's try to avoid them voting as much as possible. So I think that this is, uh, it, there is a big tension, and. Um, uh, so, what I want to do now that uh, at least we set uh, the stage, um, I want to describe a bit uh, uh, what's happening in the United States. Why do I think that the, the U.S. Uh, are becoming a more chronic capitalist economy? And, 
And, you know, it's not just uh, uh, a reaction to Trump. Unfortunately, uh, now the entire uh, debate in the United States is Trump bashing. So, uh, so intense that uh, I, I'm a contrary. I'm almost tempted to support Trump. Uh, it's very hard for me, but uh, it's, it's so extreme that it's not funny. Uh, I, I can say, and, and uh, my Capitalists for the People book in, in 2012 described this way before Trump was elected. So it's not just a Trump phenomenon. So I want to first describe a bit uh, what I see that is so different and why those principles that I listed on the left are violated every day. And two, what are the causes of this degeneration? And most important, uh, because you're lucky, you're young, and uh, it's not an overstatement to say the future is yours. Uh, so it's important to think about what can you do about it, okay? What, uh, to, to make the world a better place. So let's start from the evidence. And uh, I want to talk about impartial enforcement of the law in the United States. Um, I came to the United States, I went to the United States 30 years ago, uh, under the impression, under the myth, that this is the country that brings criminals to jails, no matter whether they are Al Capone or they are Michael Milken. Doesn't make a difference. Uh, in, uh, doesn't make a difference if the, where you are in the income distribution or whether you are a white collar uh, crime or an old fashioned criminal, uh, you are treated in the same way under the law. And I think that was true for a long time. And, and even paradoxically, even under George W. Bush, we saw uh, responsible, for example, of Enron going to jail. Uh, in spite of the fact that Enron was very close to the president. We have not seen that anymore. Now, I have a test for you, if you recognize who are these people. These people are the owners of a small bank uh, in New York, Abacus, and they have the uh, rare privilege of being the only one that were criminally indicted after the financial crisis and uh, went shortly to jail probably for the wrong reason, okay? So, um, on the other hand, do you know who is this? This is uh, CEO of Goldman Sachs, Secretary of Treasury, uh, then Chairman of Citigroup, then President of Harvard Corporation, now Head of the Council of Foreign Affairs. Uh, in New York. Now, after the financial crisis, Parliament appointed a commission. The commission investigated the, 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 the crisis and came up with 14 people that should be prosecuted. So they did what is called a referral for prosecution to the DOJ, to the Department of Justice. And two of these people were referred for two counts. The DOJ did nothing. And uh, not only Robert Rubin did not suffer any criminal investigation, let alone indictment, didn't, didn't face a, even any personal reputational cost. This guy, after that, was for 10 years president of Harvard Corporation. It's probably one of the most prestigious places, not one of the most best uh, paid places, but one of the most prestigious places in the United States of America and uh, retired from that, it got to the Council of Economic Advisor. Now, why do you think he got away with that? France in high places. He was very close to uh, Bill Clinton first and Obama later, and uh, they will not dare to go after a friend. So uh, there's a pretty clear signal that if you are a scrappy bank in New York, you can go even to jail. If you, are, if you had Citigroup, in spite of what you do, you don't go to jail. And I think that that is the first sign of a violation of equality in enforcement. Then let's look at the idea of the level playing field. Um, you probably don't know, but a uh, couple of uh, weeks ago, the state of Wisconsin announced that it will have a $3 billion subsidy to Foxconn to set up a uh, location of a factory in Wisconsin. Three billion dollars. That's a lot of money. Okay. 
uh, at the same time, uh, Amazon is auctioning off the decision to where to go for a second headquarter. And uh, uh, the highest bid is seven billion. Has not been taken yet, but it's seven billion. So these companies are really extracting from actually friend, pol friend, friendly politician a huge amount of uh, benefits. And there is a recent paper showing that uh, if you look at uh, the amount of subsidy, first of all, as you can see, the, the, this is the number, but the number of subsidies went up. And also, that's the, the orange uh, um, columns, and the blue ones represent the contribution that uh, the campaign contribution these guys got. So you see uh, that, for example, Rick Perry, governor of Texas for 14 years, uh, received very generous campaign contribution by the very firms that receive subsidies to locate in Texas. And, uh, you know, in my country of origin, Italy, this was taking place in the form of cold cash. Here they do it a little bit better uh, in the form of campaign contribution, but the quid pro quo is the same, the distortion is the same, the corruption is the same. Uh, I don't want to quote uh, Shakespeare, but uh, it doesn't matter the name, uh, a rose is still a rose. Now, uh, the other thing that you notice, and you think that this is just uh, the effect, the Trump effect, but no, there is a big tendency in the United States for business people to actually go to parliament, become governor, be involved in politics. And uh, this is uh, uh, the trend that is taking off basically at the beginning of 2000. And uh, these authors, they correlate with the China entry, entry in the WTO. It's very hard to say what it is, but, uh, but in the fact, and you see uh, the, the blue um, dotted line is a fraction of Republicans, so it's not an ideological shift. Uh, and actually many of these guys tend to be Democrats, uh, but uh, uh, there is clearly an increase in, uh, in this. Increasing this, that not surprisingly, translate in a pro-business bias in their action when in office. So what this uh, graph is doing is they look at some uh, pro-business score, uh, the way you vote or the decisions you take are ranked, um, and uh, is from uh, 1 to 100, so the higher is more, more pro-business, and they compare the score of the people elected in that legislature before and after, and when the executive is in office. And surprise, surprise, when the executive is in office, they make more pro-business decisions that benefit the stock prices of the company they were in, they still own. So uh, they basically benefit themselves. And uh, in this, uh, former Prime Minister of Italy, Berlusconi, was a pioneer because he did that with gusto and with a lot of personal benefits. Uh, the third thing that uh, has basically collapsed in the United States is the amount of uh, antitrust enforcement. Uh, the United States were pioneer in antitrust. They broke up uh, Standard Oil at the beginning of the 20th century, but they continue throughout the 20th century breaking up at and uh, going after IBM, going after Microsoft. These days, uh, the European Union is going after Google and Facebook, but the, the United States uh, uh, is not willing to, and the question is why. And, and last but not least is what I was telling you earlier, is the low intergenerational, uh, the, sorry, the high intergenerational earnings elasticity, which means very low uh, turnover at the level of Argentina uh, and uh, Italy, not at the level of the more advanced countries. So now, I want to briefly talk, what are the causes of this? Why all of a sudden, uh, or maybe not all of a sudden, but the, the United States changed so much? And why did I start with this uh, uh, watershed moment of 1989? So I don't know if you know uh, this book uh, written by a true libertarian in 1957, Ayn Rand, called Atlas uh, Shrugged. And it's a story of a strike of the productive individuals against the looters in society. Uh, and they consider that the society is like taxing too much, is uh, 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 putting too many chains and constraints 
to the creative and the powerful class so that they go in a separate uh, valley and they create their world in which they can achieve uh, their true libertarian dream. Now, what is interesting is when this book was produced in 1957, it was a fiasco. Nobody bought it. But over the years, it started to become kind of a cult and becoming more and more popular among a group of people because you have to realize toward the end of the 60s, there was a true assault to business in America. And uh, when I told you that seems unbelievable, but uh, it's not unbelievable, that uh, socialist ideas uh, that were not doing that well in Soviet Union at the time were becoming mainstream even in America. And uh, there was a moment in which uh, there was a concern about uh, uh, the free enterprise system. And not surprisingly, in a few years, you have um, a number of important uh, positions taken. Uh, one is, uh, in 1970, uh, Milton Friedman writes the famous piece in the New York Times that the only social responsibility of business is to maximize profits. And he calls like uh, uh, any form of uh, social responsibility of business a uh, socialist doctrine. So he's afraid that uh, the pressure of society is such that uh, uh, there is really no possibility of running a company in the way uh, we think companies should be run. And uh, it's not that far away from uh, 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 Galt, I think is the name in Atlas Shrug, that leaves uh, the society because it's too uh, taxed by looters and by other people. And, and I think that Friedman uh, start to raise the, the right to say, no, we can uh, uh, do differently. And a year later, there is a lawyer, at the time is simply an advisor to the Chamber of Commerce, who writes a very famous memo um, that calls the attack on the American free enterprise system. And if you read that, you can read it in two ways. Uh, the left read it as this is gigantic conspiracy. Um, but if you understand the spirit of the time, these are the people who are concerned and say, look, what keeps America going is the private business. And in universities, in, uh, in, uh, in the courtrooms, in the media world, uh, the, the job of business is almost like an insult. And uh, they are, uh, you respect more prostitutes prostitute and thieves than financiers and business people. And so we need to do something about it to change this mentality. Now, interestingly, uh, Powell was appointed uh, shortly afterward by Nixon to the Supreme Court. And in 1976, there is this very important decision, Buckley versus Valier, uh, where they need to decide what is legit and not a legit in campaign contribution. And they make a big distinction and say, okay, we cannot put limits to how much candidate spends or how much you're giving contribution to candidates because there is a risk of a quid pro quo. So there is a risk of corruption. However, any money spent to promote ideas is part of your freedom of speech right and cannot be limited in any form or shape. Okay, so that is, the, this is, uh, if you go to Citizens United, the beginning of Citizens United started in 1976. And so there is a concerted effort uh, of, uh, if you want, the business society to try to uh, push back because the world has gone too far left too far into the crazy land, we need to push back. And, uh, and you see this, this is a paper by uh, Richard Paulson and another, that shows um, basically what fraction of the vote in the Supreme Court uh, go to the seizure that are generally pro-business. And you can see that basically from the late 60s to 2000, uh, you have ups and downs, of course, but you have a clear upward trend. The Supreme Court is becoming more and more pro-business over time. Now, at the same time, the fall of the Berlin Wall creates a ideological problem. So TINA is an acronym that uh, Margaret Thatcher used to use. There is no alternative. So in the old days, there was an alternative between left and right. There was an alternative between uh, the communist ideology and the, the capitalist ideology. 
with the fall of the Berlin Wall, there is no alternative to uh, the, 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 the capitalist ideology. And so the left finds itself a bit uh, uh, empty, uh, lacks ideological differentiation, and uh, becomes pro-business even before they become pro-market. Before, even before they realize the benefit of the market, they realize the benefits of being in bed with business. And this is the moment in which you see that leaders of the left, when they retire, they either go on a speaking tour for millions, or they actually go and work for large corporations. From Tony Blair of the Labour Party in England to Schroeder of the SPD in Germany that goes and works for Gazprom, of all things, a Russian company. Uh, so the, the Prime Minister of the Chancellor of Germany that goes and works for a Russian company. The socialist, social democrat, Chancellor of Germany that go and work for the Russian company. And, and Clinton. And then you can go and list, there's a long list, uh, but uh, uh, that is uh, really shifting uh, the, the debate uh, at the same time in which business is pushing back, the right, the left has no ideological uh, uh, rooting anymore and shift in favor of business. And the right that was more integral with business to begin with, uh, without any opposition on this ground, decides to become vertically integrated with business. Uh, my favorite line that makes me uh, uh, not particularly appreciated in the States is say that uh, the great contribution of Berlusconi to humankind is to show in a very clear way what everybody else does in a, in a less uh, uh, open way. Because Berlusconi uh, owned the member of his party. They were his employees. Uh, his ministries were his past and future employ employees. And he was defending his business as prime minister. There was no even trying to cover it up in any possible form or shape. In the United States, it's a little bit better because you tend to be employee of certain companies. First of all, it's not just one, there are a few. And you tend to be employee just before your Secretary of Treasury and just after your Secretary of Treasury. Okay? But at least you have the decency that while you're Secretary of Treasury, you don't work for those companies. And for uh, the candid minds, they think that that's enough. Okay? Now, when you see Berlusconi, you understand that uh, there's not much of a difference. I'm not saying that there is no difference. There's not much of a difference. And, and it's not a, 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 su a surprise that Berlusconi uh, is the first one to take over immediately after the fall of the Berlin Wall, in the first election in 94, precisely the moment in which the, 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 uh, the left uh, has this ideological breakdown and to change the name of the party, etc. And he transformed his firm into a party. So all the first uh, line of, uh, of uh, member of parliament comes straight from his ad business. So I think that uh, that's the second thing. The third one, and, uh, and this is uh, something very delicate because it touched all of us, but is the amount of money flowing to research and academia uh, gets bigger and bigger. And uh, many people are transformed from intellectuals to advocates. And uh, it starts in the pharmaceutical industry. I was reading the other day, uh, there is a scandal of, an, of a journal, academic journal, in which they rejected the paper because it was not in line with the marketing strategy of the journal. Why? Because most of the advertising was coming from pharmaceutical companies, and this article was very much negative about pharmaceutical companies. And that was not a newspaper, it was an academic journal. Uh, the finance industry is an example. The I.O. industry, is very hard to find an I.O. economist who is not consulting aggressively and having a position that is surprisingly aligned with uh, uh, the, the position of the people working for. Of course, uh, people select, uh, so you hire somebody with that line of thinking, but thinking that this amount of incentives uh, don't have an effect on the way ideas uh, develop and are promoted will be naive. And of all people, economists cannot say that, that incentives don't matter. Okay? If you are a sociologist or a doctor, you might even say that, but as an economist, it's difficult. And, and of course, this is true in computer science. Google is financing 
most research in the United States in a certain area, including research in law on privacy, including uh, uh, newspapers in Europe, and so on and so forth. And the last one is technology. This is a, a picture taken from uh, the early uh, 20th century in America. The guy you don't recognize is Jay Gould. And he was famous because, first of all, he was a crook. Um, and uh, he manipulated a bunch of uh, stocks. He did a, a bunch of illegal stuff. Uh, but uh, the picture here is that he's using, uh, he at some point, took over uh, Western Union that at the time was the telegraph was really the line, uh, the communication line. And what you see is that with the line of the telegraph is strangling on the left all the newspapers in America and on the right all the business sector in America. Uh, why? Because information is crucial. He had the monopoly on the transmission of information and he will use that to his own advantage. And he was sort of uh, um, without any concern enough that will do it. And so he was considered the evil guy of the time. Uh, at the same time, this is a period in which, in America, you can have the titans, if you read uh, uh, um, Chernov or some uh, uh, biographers, or you call them robber baron, people that were taking advantage of their position to uh, extract rents. And uh, this happens at a time where technology provides enormous opportunities but also enormous opportunity to uh, monopolize and so on and so forth. And I think that uh, there are some aspects, and I will come back in a second, but some aspects of the large di digital platforms that remind me a lot of this period and about of Jay Gould. So now that I uh, portray such a sort of depressing picture, uh, what are the remedies? Uh, what can you do to prevent this from, from uh, degenerating uh, in, in a very negative direction. So first of all, I want to give you a warning. Uh, it's a very important warning because uh, the typical reaction is you ra rush for the door to try to introduce some legislation or some regulation. And actually, this is a quote, I will tell you in a second who wrote it, uh, is a quote that uh, is very old, but uh, it seems to be written yesterday. So don't believe that you can find a universal remedy for evil conditions or immoral practices in affecting a fundamental change in society. And don't pin too much faith in legislation. Remedial institutions are apt to fall under control of the enemy and to become instrument of oppression. So I thought that uh, I, might, uh, I was hoping to have the, the quote, but the quote is by uh, Justice Louis Brandeis. Uh, as you know, was the first Jewish to be on the Supreme Court of the United States, and uh, a very influential uh, person in transforming the United States into a better place. So the, the good news that uh, I want to tell you is the, the tension that we are experiencing today is not unlike the tension that the United States faced toward the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And two people really uh, contribute in a massive way to make the United States a better and, uh, a system, better democracy and better capitalism. One was uh, uh, Justice Louis Brandeis. The other, here is in a cartoon, is Theodore Roosevelt. And uh, Theodore Roosevelt, just to give you a sense, he's fighting, he's a little Hercules, fighting against uh, a dragon. The dragon has two heads. One head is Rockefeller, the owner of the largest uh, uh, refinery, etc., in the United States. The other is Aldrich. Uh, so famous for being called the senator of Standard Oil. He was so aligned with the interests of Rockefeller that actually if you go to Harvard, there is a place called Aldrich Hall. And if you go to Aldrich Hall, they say, donated by Rockefeller for the service provided. Okay, so uh, <laughs> that's a pretty remarkable thing, okay? Uh, now, don't laugh too much because in future generations, we will see some senators that will have a all at Harvard or Stanford donated by Google and say for the service provided, and I think that uh, or Facebook. So uh, we need to be prepared uh, for this. So what are the actions? The first one is take back the common, take back uh, the, the system, and you know uh, I think that uh, uh, the ideal thing would be some campaign finance reform, especially in the United States. However. 
uh, it's difficult because there are some constitutional constraints and changing the constitution is very, very hard. Uh, but uh, you can do a lot even without changing constitution. So for example, um, in, uh, you can spend a limited amount of money uh, in support of a candidate as long as you are not coordinating your campaign with the candidate. That's what the super PACs are about. This is where all the big money comes in, okay? Now, the irony of this is that the super PACs have the headquarters in the same building as the campaign of the candidate, Some, sometimes on the same floor. So the claim that there is no coordination is ridiculous. And if the Federal Election Commission was a bit more aggressive in enforcing this distinction, you can go a long way without going necessarily to uh, change the Constitution. The second thing, and I know I'm extremely unpopular on this after Brexit, but I think that actually direct democracy has some benefits. And there is a recent paper by John Matsusaka, a graduate of Chicago, now a professor at USC, um, who shows with the data in the United States that if you look at uh, proposals uh, in referenda, they tend to be less biased uh, in favor of business than the one that passed in the legislation. And so, in uh, you have a chance for example uh, you might agree or disagree on uh, the idea of uh, giving up uh, fractional banking uh, like uh, in the proposal that uh, did not pass in switzerland uh, last uh, weekend however the very fact that such a proposal is discussed in, in parliament the banks will never allow this to even come to the floor and uh, the fact that the, in Switzerland was possible to vote for it, I think is a, quite an indication that uh, direct democracy could be a way around the power of vested interests. And uh, I'm not an expert on this, I'm studying this, but I find quite intriguing the idea of what they call liquid democracy, which is a system where your delegation shifts as a function of the topic, and you decide who is your representative on that particular topic. And that can change over time, depending on what you learn about that person. And uh, it's something that was unconceivable until 10 years ago, because the technology did not allow it. Today is not unconceivable. It might not be something that will happen tomorrow, but it's not such a crazy idea. Why? Because we don't want an entrenched political class to sell uh, their right to represent us to the first bidder without us having anything to say with it. And I think that Direct democracy or liquid democracy are a way to go around that. Now, I like to do quizzes, so I'm going to give you another quiz of, a, of a, a very strange sentence that says, the obvious and economical solution is to break up the giant companies. This, I would emphasize, is the minimum program and it is essentially a conservative program. The solution of big business is one and for all measure in each industry and no continuing interference in the private operation of business is required or desired. Now, I offer a drink to who is able to tell me who wrote this sentence, or this couple of paragraphs. I play safe because it's nothing short of George Stigler. In 1952, he writes in uh, Fortune uh, the case against big, big business. And he says, look, we understand that big business can become monopoly, and uh, there are two ways around it. One is to regulate it. The other is to break it up. I think regulation is uh, corrupt, is before his famous piece on regulatory capture, but probably his view uh, was already set at the time. And so the, least, the path of least resistance is to break it up. And I have been very skeptical about this idea, but uh, I'm warming up in front of example like uh, uh, Facebook. Why Facebook should own Instagram and uh, uh, WhatsApp? I think that uh, wouldn't the world be a better place if there was competition between Facebook, WhatsApp, and Instagram? And by the way, Facebook was able to merge with uh, uh, WhatsApp, I think, uh, lying in front of the European Commission on Antitrust. So there's plenty of ground if you want to, to break them up. The question is, is it good for society or bad for society? And I think that breaking up the search engine of Google would be stupid because there are enormous economies of scale. But breaking up WhatsApp from uh, 
um, Instagram will only bring more competition to the industry and will probably make the system better in many dimensions, including the power that these platforms have on Washington and the power they have on the elected representative. Because we all, in the last decades, complain about uh, the finance industry being too powerful in Washington. The finance industry can only bring you money. And money is only instrumental to buy votes. Google and Facebook can bring you directly votes. Can also bring you money, plenty. But they can bring you directly votes. So for a politician, this is much more important than the money. And so they become a political threat to democracy, in my view. My favorite approach, however, is a, a more, uh, if you want, surgical one, which is to uh, try to redefine some property rights in a way that create, makes the system more efficient. So, and it's particularly more competitive. So let, let me start with something that uh, you're all familiar. Um, I'm sure you all own a cell phone and you give for granted that you can change company without giving up your phone number. That's called in jargon number portability. Now, let me break it to you. This is not a given right. Did not come with the constitution. Uh, was not even the starting point of the industry. This came through some form of regulation that say, we know that especially for adults that use their, um, business, their phone for business, uh, giving up their, their number is very costly. And this is an obstacle to competition, obstacle to switching, and obstacle to competition. And uh, is it good or bad? And, and I have a paper looking across uh, the world and countries that adopted number portability have lower cell phone prices and better quality than countries that don't. So it's pretty clear that the right direction is to go in that sense. Even if some people might say, wait a minute, aren't you expropriating the company of their phone number? So no, 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 the phone number is a intellectual prop property and you can just allocate intellectual property in the way that maximize incentives to uh, generate a better outcome. And I think in the case of uh, uh, the, the cell phone, is no doubt that's the case. But uh, you are mentioning banks and banking competition. One of the obstacles to banking competition is the pain of transferring from one account to the next. So I am a client of Citigroup, and the reason I'm a client of Citigroup is not because I love Citigroup, is because my checking, uh, my, my uh, university checks arrive at Citigroup. All my wires, my credit card, my mortgage, they're all linked there. The idea of changing them is too much to take, and I don't switch because of that. But isn't this like identical to the number portability issue? Why in a phone uh, uh, I can call AT&T and say, transfer me from Verizon, and they do it 15 minutes later, no haggling, no, nothing. Why can't I call Bank of America and say, I authorize you to transfer me from Citigroup? No question asked. Now, if you think this is a utopia, actually is the law of the land in the EU since January. In the United States, the banking industry is lobbying hard. And I suspect, I'm happy to discuss this in the question and answer, uh, I suspect that Israel will resist this uh, with the full extent. But this is getting even better because not only I can transfer, of course, my payment system, etc. I can transfer or, or even transfer, share my transaction history. So uh, in banking, we know that uh, who provides you payment system as a natural monopoly in uh, or natural advantage in lending you money. Why? Because they know everything about you. But, as every monopoly, is going to mean that uh, they're going to extract rents and they undersupply the good. That's what monopoly is about. Can't we make this competitive? The good news is with technology, yes, we can. It's so simple. You'd simply authorize Citigroup to share with Bank of America all my transaction history. It costs nothing to Bank of America. It's one command in Fortran or whatever language they use, and it's done and you have competition. And then you can keep going. So why today 
Facebook has such huge market power. So much so that even after the scandals, people switch to what? They switch to Instagram, by the way, it's Facebook. Or they go to WhatsApp, by the way, it's Facebook. You can get rid of it unless you want to go in the desert and live like a monk and not interact with anybody. Uh, you are basically convicted to deal with Facebook. Uh, we know that two-sided platforms, and Facebook is a two-sided platform, uh, can uh, be um, uh, challenged by competition if there is what is called in German multi-homing, the possibility of using two platforms at the same time. Now, with your friends, it's a bit inconvenient. Uh, I, I need to pause my picture once in this, once in that. But there are services that provide this interoperability. In fact, there was a company called Power Venture that allow you to access multiple social networks and provide the information to all the social networks. So was this intermediating Facebook? Now, you know what happened to Power Venture? They got sued by Facebook. Why? Because it turns out that in America, if I give you my login and password and the authorization to come into my Facebook account to get some data, you commit a crime. It's called hacking. And why is it a crime? Basically because Facebook said so. Okay? Because at the beginning, Facebook did exactly this in order to establish itself. But once it's an incumbent, it decides to create barriers to entry. And the best barrier to entry is the law. And so I think that the, the real battle is to redesign this law in a way that reintroduces competition in these sectors. Uh, because I don't think it's only capitalism as risk here, it's democracy itself. And if you want to know more and learn more, I strongly advise my podcast, Capital Isn't, that is available on all the major platforms. Thank you. There is a sense in which uh, you consider uh, highly concentrated industries as something really bad. But, uh, farming, for example, in the state was uh, owned by millions of households in the beginning of the 20th century. Now it's owned by a handful, mostly. And the quality and quantity of food has increased, thereby allowing labor to move to other more productive areas. Do we really need five Facebook likes, Facebook, Facebook like companies, and then it's better for society to have a one Facebook, for example? It's, it's an excellent question, and a question that uh, uh, see me on, diff on uh, a different side with many of my Chicago colleagues. So Kevin Murphy, for example, at Chicago, would be exactly on your side. And uh, his, uh, his line, which is a very good line, is say, look, I don't care about concentration per se. I care about uh, consumer benefits. And so in his example is if I, there are two towns, one with only one restaurant, the other with 10 restaurants, uh, I don't want to decide if one is better than the other. I want to see what uh, a person who is equidistant from the two goes and eat. And if the person goes and eat in the uh, town with just one restaurant, means that, that one restaurant is able to uh, be better than, uh, than the 10 restaurants better than competition. And I think there is definitely some value in that argument. However, I think this completely ignores the political economy of, uh, uh, of the system. So if you have only one restaurant in town, that restaurant will dictate the opening and closing hours, will dictate uh, the, what is allowed for food or not, will dictate the safety standard, will dictate everything, will dictate everything in the interest of that restaurant alone. And now we're talking about the restaurant. When we talk about Facebook um, or Google, so it's proven that the way you rank um, uh, news affect the way you vote. And uh, I'm not saying that Google on purpose manipulated things, but there is this correlation, which might be spurious like many correlation, between the part of America that voted for Trump and the use of Bing as a search engine. So uh, why? Because who does the, the search engine? Are Google employees, and they tend to be mostly liberal, 
And so they naturally, without any effort, they distort uh, the search in favor of Hillary Clinton. And that leads to uh, more people in doubt. Now, if you are a radical fanatic on one way or another, that doesn't change. But it, even if I don't change the news, but only change the order in which I present news, I impact your vote. And now you might say, what's different vis-a-vis uh, -vis the past? Because newspapers have been shown to influence voters and so on and so forth. And the difference is competition. So if in a world in which there are 10 newspapers, I don't care that newspaper X impact because people have a choice. In a world in which is only Google, and yeah, Bing, but sort of uh, not very many people use Bing, or in a world with only Facebook, and most people get their news through Facebooks, I am terrified of their political influence, terrified. And, uh, and so I think it is necessary, in, there, there, in my view there are only two ways to deal with the problem. Either you create more competition, uh, in the way a la Stigler, or you massively regulate them. But honestly, I don't trust the government to decide what Facebook can and cannot say. And you know that Facebook and Google, uh, a couple of months ago, decided to uh, ban any ad uh, of cryptocurrencies. Now, I'm not a fan of cryptocurrency. I don't think that there is a huge social loss in this. But the president scares me a lot because they control 90% of the online advertising. So two entities can block a business based on their preconception. Uh, that is dangerous for democracy and for capitalism as well. So I think that when it comes to uh, especially um, business that deal with transformation and communication of information, we have to be more careful. And we have to be in doubt being on the aggressive side in favor to preserve diversity rather than on the uh, sort of a uh, laissez-faire side because the risk is if we laissez-faire too much, we, there is no way back. Yes. Uh, one of your solutions was uh, the movement towards a more uh, direct uh, democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, and you gave an example uh, the referenda in Switzerland about uh, Functional Reserve Banking. Uh, don't you think that there is some problem where the where general public votes on a very complicated uh, issue that the majority doesn't even understand what are the repercussions of, uh, of uh, keeping the reserve, uh, functional reserves or uh, not keeping it? Okay. Thank you for the question because this is a fundamental question everybody asks. And, and the answer is very simple. Do you think that the member of parliaments understand better? So in, if you compare the platonic republic with a referendum, the platonic republic wins all the time. We are trying to compare real world things versus real world things. So let me tell you two things. Number one, when the Obamacare, which is probably less complicated mm, I don't know, uh, than the uh, fractional banking, when Ob Obamacare was passed, Nancy Pelosi, that was the head of the house at the time, said, we need to pass it to find out what is in it. Okay, so the, 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 par the people in parliament don't vote because they led, read the law and they decide it's good or bad, they vote on partisan lines or, or even worse, on lobbying line that what they are told is good or bad. So do I believe that in the, pub the public understand? No, the beauty is you, they don't need to understand they need to have some points of reference that they trust and they follow. So in California, for example, there is the Sierra Club, super environmental club, and uh, provides an opinion about a referendum. If you are a strong environmentalist, you vote like the Sierra Club says. If you hate the environmentalists, you vote the opposite way. So it's not that it provides only one direction or the other. It's can, and uh, that actually ends up working pretty well. And do you th really think that uh, this, all the Swiss understood what they were voting on? Absolutely not. But they try to find clues from people. Now, of course, there are costs. You cannot uh, ask people all the time. Um, but 
remember that if the people vote, which is in a sense not that far from what I call liquid democracy. So if you delegate people you trust for that thing. So I know that uh, I trust uh, this guy in, uh, I trust Doug Diamond to decide what is right in the banking stuff. And I don't need to understand fractional banking. I just need to trust Doug Diamond on that stuff. I don't trust in choosing wine because he only likes white wine and I don't trust that. Now, in, in, a, in a delegated democracy, it's a package. You have to buy the both. Uh, when you can separate, uh, it, it works much better. And one, uh, paradoxically, I rarely use Italy as a good example, but this is a good example. A paradoxically, a good example is the abortion thing. In Italy, we had a referendum on abortion. And do really people understand when sort of... Uh, Life is born? I don't understand on this when life is born, and, and, and people dis, dis, discuss a lot. Uh, but it is a very value-based thing. People voted, and that was it. They voted 20 years ago. Nobody has ever discussed, actually, sorry, 40 years ago. This is, <laughs> time flies, 40 years ago. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, they never came back, okay? So that is really, uh, on the other hand, in the United States, you try to, to get abortion through a Supreme Court decision that was too clever by half, and the result is that uh, the entire nomination of the Supreme Court and the election of the president has been kidnapped for the last 50 years by, by the state. So I think being able to separate is, is good, and now it's feasible. And I don't think there is a lot uh, to, to, to resist. But, if I was unable to convince you, I strongly recommend you, in one of the things that I do at the Stigler Center is I have these uh, uh, people giving three short lectures, and I tape them, and they are all available on, uh, on the website of, of the Stigler Center. And so the John Matsusaka last uh, May, not this one, the previous one, gave three uh, lectures on uh, the concept of direct democracy, and they are excellent. So look at them. You can download them, listen to them. It's, it's really very educational on that front. Yeah. When you spoke about the mobile number portability, so you seem to reject the deontological aspect of the company's property rights or the company's freedom to do business, because you say it, it, benefits, it benefits society as a whole. And my question is, how far will you take that? Like if, if for example, um, the government wants to fix prices because the argument is it will it will be better for society. Will you will you avoid the property rights aspect? Will you only stick to the question whether it it benefits society or not? You know, when if I am an employee, a, a researcher in a, in a real science, okay, and I work for a company, um, whatever I produce in terms of uh, patents belongs to the company, not me. So why do we do that? Uh, isn't violating my property right? Sign the contract. No, no, no. Is this is uh, by default? The the law says that by default. Okay. Uh, so uh, yes, you can try. We do bypass this, but uh, uh, the the allocation of property right is done because otherwise companies will not invest. If I invest a lot of money in a view, develop an idea, and then you can walk away tomorrow with the idea, uh, I will not invest the money. So uh, it's not the first time and not the last time that, especially when it comes to non-physical property, we define the boundaries in a way that maximizes incentives as economists. Um, and I think that uh, can be dangerous to push it too much, the idea. But I think in this phase, I don't see it as, uh, as too bad, and it seems like uh, the lesser evil, because uh, unless you think that everything is fine and don't worry, and some people do, I, I had a debate with Tyler Cohen, uh, and he's of the view that uh, uh, Google is fantastic, we want more of it, and there's no problem. And, and I agree that Google is fantastic, I use Google all the time, so I'm not complaining with the quality of the service, but I'm worried about uh, uh, their ability, for example, to uh, seize as a market by discriminating and so on and so forth. So I think that uh, if you are concerned about potential uh, 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 negative effects, I think that my approach is probably the least uh, intrusive. But 
Um, I, I understand that there are some philosophical issue with that. Yeah. Me? Yeah. Um, you just mentioned the blockchain methodology. Would you maybe think that the blockchain can help this, uh, these processes of kind of like, um, um, you know, dealing with Google and Facebook and stuff like that? I wish that was true. I am less optimistic about blockchain than most people are uh, for two reasons. One, uh, that uh, you probably would be able to read in a couple of days on the pro market blog of the Steeler Center because one of my colleagues has a paper uh, explaining, actually using game theoretic argument to explain uh, the intrinsic limit of blockchain. Let me give you a short preview. Is uh, what makes the blockchain reliable is the uh, incentives of miners not to collude to make the blockchain collapse. However, as let's call Bitcoin, as Bitcoin becomes more established and becomes traded in liquid markets, you have a strong incentive to short Bitcoin and then do an attack at the blockchain and become super rich. It's a bit like people that speculate in the stock market before 9-11. Uh, you have an incentive to do that. And so that puts a limit on how widespread the blockchain is. Now, blockchain as a technology is uh, going to be used. And when you hear people adopting blockchain, most of the time, what they adopt is a permission-based version of blockchain, which does not have all the brilliant properties that we like them to have, i.e. they want to create competition, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, is a system of uh, is a ledger, is a common ledger for a group of trusted parties. And that works beautifully, but unfortunately does not enhance competition, quite the opposite, because if you're not part of that network, you're cut out. Yeah. Uh, you talk a lot about how um, the political economy uh, is one of the reasons why incentives turn uh, all these corporations into things which are harmful for us. The same political economy, obviously, is what is resistant to the type of changes you want to, to create. So I was wondering how you see the process of bringing about um, the, the way you want the markets to work to actually happen. So I think it's uh, quite important, number one, to disseminate the information. And uh, what I've been doing with my center, uh, as an I direct, with uh, the pro market, with the capitalism podcast, etc., is to start a conversation on this. Even the difference between being pro-market and being pro-business is obvious after you hear it, but most people tend to mix it. And so I think that generating the sensitivity uh, in a broader set of people that that's an issue, I think is creating a constituency for change. And then the hope is to try to uh, have m more direct ways to appeal to people. I think that uh, um, in, in, in a sense, if you have a more educated group of people and this understand the problem, uh, the solution will come. And uh, uh, my source of optimism is the experience of the United States at the beginning of the 20th century, because uh, back then uh, was even worse in terms of uh, uh, concentration of wealth and uh, money in politics. I, I didn't bring it here, but there is a beautiful graph that I integrated with recent years about how much was spent in campaign financing uh, as a sort of adjusted by GDP uh, from the 1896 to today. And the peak was actually 1906, uh, before a law that puts restriction on campaign financing. Uh, and now we are going up, but we're still below those peaks. So I think that. Uh, change can take place in a democracy. So it's, number one, it's very important to preserve the right to vote, and number two, uh, to educate people so that they vote in an intelligent way. So, uh, I guess, you know, I'm listening to you here, and uh, what, what I would say is this, I, I think we certainly agree that this issue of quarter capitalism is a problem. So I can, translation of economic power to political power to limit competition. But the question is, when we start the solution, I'm, I'm not fully totally, totally clear. From our point of view, um, I guess I would, I would say this. The question is ultimately what do we want to do? Because objectives, you know, there's all kinds of objectives, all kinds of things we can do. Uh, from our point of view, 
point of view, say, okay, look, what we want to do is produce growth. Produce growth and have people free to participate in it. So the index we use, which I find to be very beautiful, is this measure of economic freedom, which is basically law, limiting government. If we're worried about camp campaign spending, the, the, real, the real problem is, is too much politics. You know, if you limit the size of government, okay, then, then you limit the, the, the problem of people influencing things by spending a lot of money. If we want to control the amount of money that people are spending and leave the influence of politics large, then we just make things worse. So, uh, I think that uh, we, we agree with one distinction. Um, actually, I want to ask if uh, we agree or disagree on this point. So there are two views of the world. Uh, one is saying minimum government. The other is saying minimum government, but the need, and I quote from uh, Luigi Naudi, uh, destroying the daily trenches that producers put to defend their own margin and business. So that should the government intervene to promote competition and defend competition or should not. I am of the camp that say it should. And I think that at least initially Stigler was in that camp, became less sort of a sanguine of this over the years. Uh, but I think became less sanguine because the problem became less severe. So one thing that I should have mentioned is, is uh, in uh, the 1960s, uh, buying, having like seven or 8% market share was considered a monopoly position and will not allow, uh, the, the judge will not allow you to merge, okay? Today we look at this and say, that's crazy. And that's exactly what uh, the Chicago school did back then, said, this is crazy, we need to change. So I think that uh, that reaction at that time was absolutely right. But now we're going to the opposite extreme in which everything goes, and so, uh, we, we need to rebalance things a little in, in the middle. So, are you in favor of a strong antitrust or not? That's a question for you. Am I? Yeah. No. Why? Because, uh, and again, I, I, I've just seen too much of it. That, that I, I too much antitrust? That, that I, I think that the problem, the problem, I would say it this way. Like, let, let's take it and, and bring it to what everybody, what Israelis know about. Uh -huh. the, what they call here, Rikuzio concentration. Uh -huh. okay. There's too much of it. The question is, how do we deal with the problem? So, uh, to me, that, that we can, for instance, like take your example of, of direct, direct democracy with yeah. politicians, and you ask the question, do you really think the politician knows more? So uh, do we really think that we can have a bureaucrat sit in his office and decide what the right size of company should be? So I, th I think the problem is what we need to do is make sure we have maximization competition, make maximization of the ability to enter and, and exit the markets, and let things work. So for instance here, we look at, 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 at concentration, I don't think the way to deal with it is to get somebody in the government to figure out who should have what and how, how big everything is. What, should, what we should do is make sure we open up the borders of this country. As I, as I was saying before, how come there's no international banks here? I think, I think we, there's no international banks here is because we have crony capitalism keeping competition out. So the way to deal with concentration is to open up the borders. And let's have some competition, and that will deal with the problem. I'd rather have that than have some bureaucrat decide how big some company should be. No, I agree that probably in Israel the easiest thing to fix the banking sector is to open up borders. Okay, uh, but think about uh, uh, the Facebook case. The, imagine that Facebook uh, uh, control ninety percent of the news distribution in the United States. You're not worried about. It. You don't do anything. I, I think as long as uh, somebody can open up a business and compete with it. You cannot compete because there are, there are gigantic uh, network ex externality. And it says people advertise where the eyeballs are. And the eyeballs are where everybody else is. So uh, you, 
you can enter, but you have zero chance of succeeding. Or think about Google. We know that there are enormous economies of scale in, in search. So we know that all the other search engines are ridiculous. Have you ever tried to search on, with Bing? It's a disaster. <laughs> so, so I think that uh, there is clearly a natural monopoly there. And uh, I don't want to break it up because I think it would be inefficient. But I want to prevent Google from offering uh, shopping services because then they, they're going to say if they can rank things, they're going to pick uh, which shopping services you have, which candidates you elect, uh, which wife you're going to marry, uh, everything. Uh, I think that that's, that's too much power. I, I must confess, I'm not feel oppressed by Google. Okay, um, I, I'm glad you don't because I do. I do. I would like to add something, if I may. <laughs> um, well, people, people have did say the, the very same things on, for example, Microsoft in the past, and for example, on Google on the other issues. Mm -hmm. And and the thing is that as long as that as long as the the, the entry the entry barriers are, are low, um, the, these companies have to keep the products um, have to keep the products being the best, or else they, they'll collapse. For example. When when Google tried to end to enter the uh, the uh, the social networks uh, um, market um, with uh, with Google Plus, mm -hmm. people remember that they failed absolutely. Though they utilized all the measures they had as as, as a search engine uh, 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 monopoly or or pseudo monopoly, they even utilized Gmail to to, to promote Google Plus. I remember getting tons of advertisement on on Gmail, and yet they failed because the product was just. A bad product. Well, because there was a monopoly on the other side. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there was no monopoly on the other side because before no, Facebook, no. there was MySpace. MySpace, they, they, they were feared to, to be a great monopoly then. But Facebook. Sorry, at the beginning of a social network, there is competition. And then when uh, the market consolidate, competition is much more difficult. But you use the Microsoft example. The Microsoft is a beautiful example because the reason why today we have Google and Facebook and not just Microsoft is because of antitrust. Okay? Because you're too young to remember, but before sort of Excel, there was a thing called Lotus 123. And it was better than Excel. Before Word, there was a thing called Word Perfect, and it was much better than Word. And and before Outlook, there was a thing called Eudora, much better than Outlook. You could actually search stuff unlike Outlook. Okay? Why did these appear? Because they got incorporated in the office suite. And Microsoft was slowly incorporating everything. So it was actually destroying innovation because the incentive to innovate were why do I have to innovate something if Microsoft copy, insert it, and bundle it and give it for free? And when the antitrust case was brought, as a judge said, uh, no, a, um, a lawyer said, the remedy was not the remedy that was done at the, at the end. The remedy was the trial. During the trial, Microsoft was afraid of being too aggressive in the stuff they did. And that created a space for Google and Facebook to arise. So now the table turns. It's the time for Google and Facebook to be subject to the same thing. And, and then we can go back in history. The reason why Microsoft arose to begin with is because IBM was under an antitrust investigation. And so they play differently in the PC market because they were afraid of the antitrust. And so antitrust favors innovation. Is the, the idea that uh, the best way to have uh, innovation is to give monopolies, this is sold by corporation because in their interest to do so. Okay? There is very little evidence that that's the case. The real way to promote innovation is to have competition, and the way of competition is to make sure that the incumbents can be threatened. Yes. I have a question. If antitrust against Google or Facebook, personally, I think should happen. Mm -hmm. um, I, as I research information warfare and the effect of these companies on elections, on security matters, but at the end of the day, they control the internet. Like what other means does a country have? Like I see the European bill, like the right to be forgotten. Mm -hmm. If Google doesn't want to do it, it, it cannot. And the only tool the country has is to shut down the shelter, but then that's not democratic and that's shutting down the freedom of speech. So what other tools does a country have, especially when all institutions are in such low rates of uh, 
Right, Esteem, yeah. yeah. Like, I would not believe Israel that it's protecting my favor when it shuts down Facebook. I would believe Facebook that Israel is trying to mm -hmm. undermine something. You, you're touching an excellent point because uh, uh, actually, the, the other day, somebody was telling me, uh, imagine your banks gave you uh, interest uh, at, the, at the prime rate, so no, no cost for, for borrowing, no cost for credit card, no cost for any, everything free, in exchange for all your data. Wouldn't you love your banker? That's exactly what Google is doing. Uh, the difference between the Robert Baron or the railways and the Telegraph is that at the time they were charging for it because they were not too necessarily two-sided platform. They were charging for it, and so they generated a revolt of consumers. Today, consumers love Google, love Facebook because it's free. And so you're absolutely right. The, the point is, is even dangerous for a politician to go after that uh, those because the the, the the people might say why. Uh, and it's not surprising that the only uh, institution going after Google is the European Union, which is the less democratic of them all. Uh, because uh, they, uh, Margaret Vestager is not facing re-election anytime soon. Uh, I'm sure that if she did face re-election, she, she would be less aggressive. So I think it is a problem, uh, but because we have not, we're going back to education, we're not un educated people to understand that you know, there's no free lunch, and uh, when you think that Google gives you stuff for free, in fact, you're paying in two ways. One, with your data, and two, uh, by with the, when you buy products, there's embedded the cost of the advertising that they do on Google that is higher because Google has a market power. So that is uh, uh, the, the, the way you indirectly pay for, for your product. Uh, but it clearly, uh, is easier to sell the stuff that Google is uh, don't do any evil because uh, they they give you the product for free. Yes. If I can say something uh, also to Bob and to you, uh, me and Bob working at Antitrust Authority of Israel. Good. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, I think it's important to say that Antitrust Authority um, also advise to the regulators how to uh, be how to have regulations that are much more competitive and specifically to Bank of Israel, uh, how to, I don't know, make, make his rules to be much more competitive and uh, help uh, to bring more banks. Uh, it's not only monopolies, it's also the government. Actually, you're raising an excellent point because at one of the conferences of Stigler, we had Mario Monti, who was the former European commissioner for competition, came to the conference and was trying to explain what are the difference between the uh, European Union and and uh, the United States. And one of the difference is that uh, uh, in the European Union, you don't have an antitrust authority, you have a competitive authority. So it looks more globally at competition. In the United States, this stuff is more fragmented. And so I think that uh, institutions do matter, and I'm glad to hear that in Israel, at least you have this, this good uh, aspect that you can uh, really leverage a lot in, in promoting competition. No, I, I... I just happened to see the other day that the um, number of the number of companies uh, ch changed in the Dow Jones average mm -hmm. since the founding of the Dow. It's changed 51 times, mm -hmm. and it's just been the change has been incredible. And everybody over history has looked at these companies and said, like they they control everything. And the fact is, is is over time. Uh, the, the, they, they come and go. The, the, the changes has, has, has been incredible. I think even, you know, look, you're talking about Microsoft. Before, Mark, the thing that enabled Microsoft was, was the PC. Mm -hmm. and, and everyone thought that IBM controlled the world. You know, and Steve Jobs went into his garage and he changed the world. Yeah, but it did change it because IBM was under an antitrust investigation. If it wasn't for that case, IBM would have vertically integrated the PC, would not have asked uh, uh, Bill Gates to provide the software, would be the internally uh, produced software, would be a completely different world. So I think that uh, we underestimate the importance of promotion of competition. That, that's my, my view. Well, I, we don't. I, I think the competition is, is the most important thing. The question is, is how do you get it? 
you know, and, what, and what's the nature of it. So I would say the, the way to get it is, is, first of all, a clear law. And actually, maybe, I don't know if this is provocative or not to say, but I think law is independent of, of democracy. Law is a, it's objective. Law is, law is something that, that evolves. It's what, what, uh, what, what F.A. Hayek called the, the rules of, of, of spontaneous order. We don't make it up. So, so law is not a product of democracy. So what, you know, that, that property rights, you know, not stealing is not, is not a product of democracy. It's a product, it's a product of, 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 of the evolution of objective law. That, so I think what we want is good law, protect property rights, and, and minimize the politicization of our laws. So we want competition. The question is how to define it and, and, and how to get it. Other questions? Okay. okay. Wait, wait, wait. One, one last question. Yes. Um, a couple of years ago, we were um, interviewed in Israel, a major newspaper. We were also having a um, conversation published with Netanyahu. Uh, mm -hmm. um, did you see, um, did you follow what happened in Israel since then? Did you see any change? Do you have any thoughts about it? Uh, honestly, I've not followed so closely. I know that uh, Netanyahu has changed quite a bit from the time that uh, um, he actually claimed to have read my book and liked my book. Um, I think that all this is what generated uh, the interest of a uh, guy who wanted to interview me with Netanyahu. But I have to say that when I spoke with him, I was quite impressed of uh, his uh, intellect and also knowledge of economics. Uh, I remember that there was a question about how do you define the competitive market system, et cetera, and Netanyahu gave an answer that uh, was fantastic. I don't think I could have given a better answer. And uh, maybe because I have more experience with uh, US or Italian politicians, but I was really impressed by his, his ability. Now, he's a politician, so uh, politicians uh, change their mind depending on, on uh, uh, the, the, the way to get consensus. So, um, But this said, I think, uh, is quite an intellect.